theyeshiva.net. Our topic this evening is how do we speak to the four sons, to the four children in our own homes, in our own families, in our own communities? Or who are the four sons today? Who are they? What are their questions? Are we addressing those questions? Do we have answers? <laughs> what are the answers? The truth is that each one of the four sons probably deserves a separate shear, and maybe not one, but many. Uh, yet tonight, since it's a week before Pesach, we'll have to try to uh, compress them all in, uh, in one shear. But I just have to say it's impossible to really exhaust the topic and give it the attention it deserves. Oid chazayin l'moyed bezer Hashem. But we will try to be brief and concise and at least give one point to think about in connection to all of the children, all of the four sons. I think I once shared with you there was a Jewish Nobel Prize winner. He won the Nobel Prize in physics. His name was Isidore Rabi. He was born in Galicia. He passed away in 1988, I believe. And he was once asked how he managed to become such a great physicist to the point of winning the Nobel Prize. And he said, my mother made me a scientist. I asked him, how did your mother make you a scientist? He said, he grew up, he went to school, yeshiva in Brooklyn as a kid. He said, all the other, my other classmates came home and their father and mother asked them one question. Did you learn anything today in school? What did you learn? What did you learn? <laughs> Tell me what you learned. He said, my mother, when I came home from school, she said, I don't care if you learned anything today in school. I just have, I want to ask you one thing. Did you ask a good question today in school? He said, that turned me into the scientist I became, and I received the Nobel Prize. There is a profound idea in that, and that is that Pesach, one of the most important themes of Pesach is questions, 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 questions. And the reason for that is because the Torah addresses the Seder of Pesach, the conversation of Pesach in terms of questions and answers. When your child will ask. To the point that there is a mitzvah that the child should ask questions and the parents should respond to the questions. And Chazal tell us in Pesachim that even if there are adults at the table, they should ask each other questions. And Chazal continued that even if you're sitting yourself you're having a say they're all alone, you should ask yourself questions. Now that seems very strange. I understand you ask me a question, I ask you a question. Why am I asking myself a question? Just say what you want to say. This means that the question itself contains a very powerful, a very powerful idea. And I think one explanation in that is that slaves don't ask questions. Free people ask questions. People who are slaves, people who are abused, people who are victims, who are tormented, are taught that they're not allowed to ask questions. All abuse happens in silence. All, uh, all discrimination, all abusive behavior happens in cover-ups. Painful situations are silenced. They're under the rug sometimes for many decades. Slaves don't ask questions because they're not allowed to challenge the status quo. Free people probe. They ask. They wonder. They challenge. And that itself is a very powerful idea. So the night of Pesach, the night of freedom, is dedicated to questions where each father and each mother turns to their child and says, ask, ask. 
Ask whatever you want. And I'm here to listen. It's not even so important if I have an answer, I don't have an answer. I ask anybody over here, did you ever get an answer to the four questions? The answer is, where's the answer to the four questions? We hope by the time your father finished, you were already sleeping two hours later, so you didn't care about an answer to the four questions. But the truth is that the questions themselves constitute the objective. Of course, the answer is important, but ask, and it's not so much important about the answer, what's important is that you feel the freedom to ask. Particularly, the Haggadah revolves around four questions. Four questions that come from four different children. As they're called, the Arba Bonim. And if you look in your source sheet, let's see how the Haggadah Shal Pesach introduces it. This is a well-known paragraph because it's from the paragraphs in the beginning of the Haggadah. So it has mazel, people are still in the mood. If I would discuss, you know, Rabbi Yossi Haglili, how many makas there are, nobody's listening anymore. They're too tired, they're just waiting for the Shulchan Aruch, for the egg and for the chicken. But at this point, the kids are still taking out their Haggadahs, people are still sitting around the table, and the father hopefully is still awake. So you remember this paragraph. Baruch HaMokim Baruch Hu Baruch Shinas Antoyer L'Ama Yisrael Keneged Arba Bonim Dibre Toyre Echad Chachem Vechad Rosh Echad Tam Vechad Shanidei Elisha Translation Blessed is Hashem, blessed is He. Blessed is He who gave Torah to His nation. Israel, blessed is He. The Torah addresses four children, the wise son, the rebellious son, the Tam, the, the simple son or confused son, and the one who doesn't know what to ask. That's the introduction. Now the obvious question is, where did the Torah speak about four sons? This is not an original quote from the author of the Haggadah. It comes from the Mechilta, which is the Medrash, the commentary written by the Tanoim on Sefer Shmois. And the Mechilta says that the Torah addressed four sons, and this is a quote from the Mechilta. The question is, where did the Torah address four children? Where did the Chazal come up with the idea that Torah speaks to four children? It doesn't say in Chumash that Hashem speaks, Torah speaks to four children. But they came up with this from a very interesting in a very interesting way. Basically, there are four different psukim throughout Chumash where Moshe Rabbeinu speaks about conversations between parents and children. Four times. Three times in Parshas Boy, one time in Parshas Ve'eschan and 40 years later. Three times he speaks about children right when they leave Egypt. Right by Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. The last time, again, four decades later. The first time is in Parshas Boy, Perik Yud Beis, Pasuk Chafei. Let's see the Pasuk. Moshe speaks, When you come to the land that Hashem will give you, as he said, you should preserve this work. When your children will say to you, What is all this work that you're doing? You should say, Tell them this is an offering of Pesach. Hashem leaped over the houses of the Jewish people in the Egypt when he plagued the Egyptians and he rescued our homes, our families. When the nation heard this, they prostrated themselves, they bowed down. They kneeled and they bowed down. So let's just learn Rashi. Rashi says, Why did they bow down? Why did they kneel and prostrate themselves? Three reasons. First of all, they hear that they're going to be redeemed. Number two, they hear that they're going to arrive in the land of Eretz Yisrael. And number three, they hear that they're going to have children and their children are going to ask them questions. So that's why they kneel for three reasons. They're enslaved in Egypt. We're going to leave, number one. Number two, we're going to arrive in our homeland. And number three, we have children. So they kneel in a form of praise and gratitude. That's the first time Moshe speaks about a conversation with children. Maha avoid the What is this avoid for you? A little while later, the next chapter, Perik Yud Gimel Pasuk Ches, Moshe Rabbeinu says, V'higadet ha'levincha ba'yoyma hu leima ba'avur za'asa Hashem li b'tzeisim ha'mitzrayim. You should tell your child that day, namely, because of this, because of these things that I do on the night of Pesach, Hashem did this for me and took me out of Mitzrayim. 
The next is just a few psukim later. Perik yud gimel pasik yud dalit. V'hayak yishal chavin chamach aleimer mazois. When your child tomorrow will ask you what is this, tell him that with a strong arm, arm God took us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Finally, in Parshas Veschana, in Perik Vav Pasik Chav, Moshe Rabbeinu says, Ki Yisholcha Vincha Machar Leimer Maha Eidas Vachukim Vamishpatim Asher Tziv Hashem Alekenu Aschem. When your child will ask you what are all these statutes and laws. And rules that Hashem has commanded you. Tell your son, We were slaves to Pari Mitzrayim. Hashem took us out with a strong arm. Four different verses address the same theme. Children speaking to their parents and asking about the significance of the Seder, the significance of Pesach, the significance of the work, and you responding to them. Come the Chazal and say, why repeat yourself four times? Obviously, let's be sensitive to nuance and discover it's not the same child. The four psukim are addressing four different children. It's not the same child asking the question. It's four different sons. So now you get the background and you see how Chazal came up. These four psukim they assumed were four children. But now the question is, how did they know how to match up whom to whom? For example, the first verse, they match up to whom? In the Haggadah? No. <laughs> the Chachim is the last one. The Chachim is the last one. In the Haggadah, he's the first. Moshe Rabbeinu speaks about him all the way at the end. The first one he actually addresses is who? Is the Russia. That's very interesting. How do we see? Look at the first one. Those are the words the Haggadah is going to put into the mouth of the Russia. The second one, who is that? So take a look in the Haggadah and you'll see. Let's see what the Haggadah says. Comes the Haggadah and says, You see, we read the Haggadah without the, the backdrop, so it beca- we, don't, we, we can't af- fully appreciate the full picture. You have to see how did the Haggadah develop this theme. So now we saw the Pesukim. Let's see the Haggadah. What does the Chachem say? The, again, the Torah never says it's a Chachem. The Torah just says it's your son. They're all your children. We are saying it's a Chachem. The Haggadah is saying it's a Chachem. The Chazal assumed this, this kid is wise, intelligent. What does he say? That's a quote from Parshas Ve'eschanon. What you should share with him is the laws of Pesach. Including the last law of the Seder, which is Ein Maftirin Achar HaPesach Afikoiman. After you eat the carbon Pesach, there's no dessert. Afikoiman is Afikuman. Bring out the dessert, bring out the, the appetizer, the chocolate mousse, the vanilla ice cream, the strawberry, whatever, the strawberries, whatever it is. Once you eat the carbon Pesach, there's no dessert. Ah, you'll ask me why in the hotels they have a Viennese table. I don't know. I don't answer those questions. It's a good question. Today, we don't have a carbon Pesach. Instead, what do we eat in lieu of the carbon Pesach? We eat, of course, some more of the delicious matzah because we didn't have enough during the night, so we eat a little more of the matzah. So at the end of the meal, after the full meal, before benching, we eat the afikoiman. That is in commemoration of the carbon Pesach. And at that point, hopefully, it tastes like lamb chops, at least on some level, if you drank enough. So after the afikoiman, there's no eating anymore. That's the last thing we eat. This is what you should tell the Chachem. Let the matzah linger in your mouth. There's no eating, and according to many, not even drinking, and some say not even water. Okay. Next. Where did they get this from? The first Pasuk. In Parshas Boy, they're still in Egypt. What does the Haggadah say? The Russia says, Lachem veloy loy. What is this avoid for you guys? Lachem, for you. Veloy loy, not for him. It's not for me. Because he excluded himself from the community. He denies God. Gets exciting. Now you should blunt his teeth. You know what blunt his teeth means? Doesn't mean to chop out. Doesn't mean to knock out his teeth. means means make the teeth not sharp. Make the teeth, they shouldn't be an edge. They shouldn't be sharp. Blunt them. The Emor Loy and tell dilute them. The Emor Loy tell him, Ba'avurza osa Hashem li betzeisim emitzrayim. 
which is actually a quote from a different pasuk. This is what Hashem did for me. Li, me, v'loi, loi, not for him. Ilu, hoyashem, lo hoyanigal. If he would have been there, he would have not been redeemed. Next, tam ma'ho Mazois, what is this? Where did they get this question from? This is the third one, right? The last one in Bai. V'hoya ki yishol chavin chamacher leimer. Mazois, this they put into the mouth of the simple child or the confused child. What do you tell him? V'amarte lo v'choy zikyo de tzion Hashem em etzam beis havodim. Actually, this quote is direct. Finally, you have a she'enu yedei alisho, the one who doesn't know what to ask. At p'sach loy. You open up the conversation. This is the second one in Parsha's boy. It says you should tell your child because of this Hashem took me out of Mitzrayim. Why did they put this posik into the mouth of the one who doesn't know how to ask? Why do you think this posik, not the other ones? Exactly. All the other three begin with a question. This is the only one where there was no question. You initiate the conversation. Hence the Haggadah says, At psachlo, you open up the conversation because there's absolutely no question. The question, however, is, if we can ask a question, not like the Sheni Yedei Elishal, how did they know who to match up to whom? For example, why would they take the first posik and put it in the mouth of the Russia? He says, Ma avoid hazois lachem. And the Chachim says, They're almost saying the exact thing, almost verbatim. When the Russia says, Lachem, we go crazy. Lachem v'loyloy. The Chachim said the same thing. Why don't we say, Eschem v'loy oisoy? He's the Tzadik, he's the Chachim. And he, he says, Lachem, Lachem v'loyloy. He also asked, what's all this about? It seems almost verbatim, but this they put into the mouth of the Russia. The other they put into the mouth of the Chachim. We could understand why the middle one they put into the mouth of the Tam, because he just says, Mazois. What's this? Somewhat ambiguous, he asks, but he asks Mazois. The truth is that they, if you could put your cell phones on vibrate, please. And hopefully by the Seder too. Chazal were very sensitive to nuance. I want to point out three things about the first Pasuk, and you'll see why they assumed that this was a rebellious kid. Number one, the other two, you have Ahaya ki yish vincha. Here you have Ahaya ki yoimru aleichem b'neichem. They're not asking, they're saying. That's number one. Number two, this is the only one in which the question is in plural. It's not all the other three you're speaking to one person. Here, there's a conversation with many people. Number three, this is interesting. All the other three have the word lamer. Right? Here, it should have said lamer. All these three details demonstrated to our sages that we were dealing with the child who was rebellious. Why? There are people who ask questions and there are people who make statements. The two are very different. A question I can answer. A statement is not, I can't answer because the person is not seeking an answer. Like the old, uh, the old word they attributed to Reb Chaim Brisk or maybe Reb Zalman Meltzer, different books different sources, but the Vart is, he said once uh, to somebody who had lots of questions, he said, I can't answer your questions, he says, Ateretz kemen geben afa shayla. Bekenish geben ateretz afa teretz. Some questions are questions. Some questions are not questions. They're just answers, they're excuses. They're ways of making a point cynically where you actually have an axe to grind, you're not seeking information or wisdom, you just want to make a statement in the form of a question. So how can I answer an answer? I can answer a question, not an answer. I think the Meshachachma points this out, it says Kiyomru. Number two, Lamer, what does Lamer mean? Lamer means to say back, to repeat. The child asks you a question, Lamer, he wants to hear an answer. This child doesn't want to hear. 
he's just saying, he doesn't want a response. In other words, you may give him a response, but it's just going to trigger a new response. Number three, questions are really individual searches. That's why it's your child asking you a question. Here, there's teamwork. <laughs> this guy is using the support of a whole group when there's a group that makes fun together, it's always more geschmack. It's always more juicy. It's always more delightful. They're sitting and smoking cigarettes and eating cholent and making fun. So now everybody feeds off everybody else's cynical energy. It's not the way of an honest conversation of a curious and inquisitive person. All the Bnei HaYeshiva here know exactly what I'm talking about, about the two types of conversations. So therefore... We have here three nuanced proofs that we're dealing with the Ben Rasha. None of them exist in the other Psukim. My question, however, to you is the Haggadah changes the response. In Chumash it says, And the Haggadah gave a whole Drasha Lachem, quoted by Vuzas Hashem, Libetesim, and Mitzrayim. Let's go one step further. When we dissect the words of the Haggadah, the responses to these four children seem very difficult to comprehend. What is the Chacham asking? What are all these laws that Hashem commanded you? What is bothering him? And we don't compare him to the Rasha. Yet the response seems even more strange. Why are we telling him you don't eat anything after the Afikoyman. And how does that respond and answer his question? We come to the Russia, we call him a Kaifer Be'iker. He never denied God's existence. He just asked, Ma Vaida Why are you calling him a Kaifer Be'iker? Next, who invented this idea to blunt his teeth? Moshe Rabbeinu never said that. Where did the Chazal come up with this? And how is that exactly going to be effective? We usually don't have this. Somebody asks a question, get into his teeth. Like, what now? I never heard at an, a conference of educators, they'll say, these questions, you get your fist into his teeth. Like, what is the Haggadah telling you? Okay, now what happens? He won't be a Russia. What's going to happen? He'll run away from the house. What's exactly the point? Another interesting thing is, he's speaking in second person, and we're speaking in third person. He said, He doesn't say, He's speaking to the family. That's what the Pasuk says. So we should respond. We should say, right? We should say, Suddenly, the response goes to third person, as though he's not present. When he's there and he just spoke to us in second person, we move it to third person. When it comes to the Tam, he says, Mazois, and we say, yod. What was the question? What was the answer? With the Shaini Yadeh Elishoil, what exactly is the message we're giving him that we didn't give the other children? And how is that a response to the one who doesn't know how to ask? If you look at the introduction to all of these questions and conversations, it becomes even more strange. Baruch HaMakayim, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shanasan Tayyilam Yisrael, Baruch Hu. What is that all about? Baruch HaMakim, blessed God. Okay, that's always good. Baruch Hu, blessed is He. Okay. Baruch Shenosan Torah La'ama Yisrael, blessed is He who gave Torah. Okay. And now again, Baruch Hu, you just said Baruch Hu. Why are you saying it again? Kenegadar Ba'a Banim Dibra Torah. Why is this Baruch HaMakim, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shenosan Baruch Hu, an intro to the sentence about the fact that Torah addresses four children? To bless the Rebbeinu Shalom is a wonderful thing. Why does this come in the Haggadah as the opening of the paragraphs that are going to deal with the four children and why this repetitive expression of blessing Hashem in four different ways and repeating the who twice? And then the Haggadah says, Echad Chachem, Echad Rasha, Echad Tam. Really, grammatically, it should have said, Kenegadar Ba'abonim Dibritayra, Chachem. Russia, Tam Vesheni Yedei 
What's the Echad Chacham? Obviously, if you'll count, you'll see it's one and one and one and one. Why would the Haggadah put it in such uh, strange terminology? Did I ask enough questions? The Zibit is... I don't know where we're holding. <laughs> The truth is, of course, that all these questions allow us to excavate some of the deeper meaning, some of the deeper layers that exist in these four paragraphs. Because the truth is that these four paragraphs contain within themselves volumes of pedagogical and educational paradigms and perspectives. They really contain within them values of information and wisdom and the art of education. Even if you'll just take the opening words, keneged arba bonim dibra teira. Think about those four words, keneged arba bonim dibra teira, five words. Teira speaks about four children. I hear immediately three messages here. Message number one. There is no one child. There are four children. In other words, get rid of the notion that all the children could be grouped into one group and dealt with in the same way. God, who created mankind and the Jewish people and gave us the Torah, says immediately, there is no one child and there is no one cookie-cutter model that fits all children. There is no one answer, one statement, one verse, one response that belongs to all children. Keneged arba bonim, dibra Torah. Torah speaks about four different children with different questions, with a need of different approaches and different responses. Number one. Paradigm number two. Keneged arba bonim. These four characters are very different. We're going to see in many ways they're diametrically opposed. But one thing you have to remember, they are all your children. They are all your bonim. So you're going to look at one extreme and another extreme. Never treat one of them as though he or she is not your child. Number three, keneged arba bonim dibra Torah. Torah has what to say to each one of these four children. Don't entertain the notion and say, this kid is beyond repair. For this child, we have no message. For this child, we have absolutely nothing to teach or say. This guy is on his or her own path. No. May, I may have not discovered in Torah the wisdom, the depth, the information, or the inspiration that can speak to this child. But the Torah has a message, has a paradigm, has a perspective for each one of these four children. Just these three ideas alone. Number one, keneged arba bonim. Number two, keneged arba bonim. They're all bonim. Number three, dibra teira. Teira has what to say to each one of them. Is often a paradigm shift for many people. Because often we don't take seriously the fact that there are arba bonim. We ultimately believe that there's one child and everybody ultimately has to fit in in one way or another with slight little adjustments. That's not true. They're very, very different, those four kids. And that's why there's four different psukim. And that's why Moshe will speak about different children asking different questions, even though they sometimes sound the same. And what's so interesting is, more or less, it sounds like the same question. But it's not the same question because it's coming from a different child. Somebody once told me, he said, never answer the question, answer the person. Sometimes two people are asking the same question, but the answer has to be different. Because you can't only answer a question, you have to answer the person asking the question. And the person is above the question, there's more to the person than the question. You have to see in the question what the person is, is being bothered by intellectually or emotionally or psychologically or all of them. And the truth is that these four children exist in every generation. They exist in every community. They exist in every school. They exist in every classroom. They exist probably in every home. 
and I think we could take it a step further and say they exist within every single person. The four children are not just four children we point. Here is this kid and this kid and this kid. Like somebody once in a classroom said, we're going to go through the four sons and everybody raised their hand when they are called upon. This was great pedagogical sensitivity. When I say the Chacham, raise your hand. When I say the Russia, raise your hand. When I say the Tam, raise your hand. And when I say the Shaini Yadei Elishal, raise the hand. Problem is that that teacher ended up with a whole classroom of Shaini Yadei Elishals because uh, nobody raised their hand. <laughs> but all of them exist within every child and all of them exist within each of us. So on Pesach, we address the child and we address the inner child. And when you address your own inner child, you're addressing four parts of your personality. There's a part of you that's a Chacham. Ask your Shvigar, she'll tell you which part. There's a part of you that's a Russia. You can ask your wife about that. Just a joke. There's a part of you that's a Tam. You can ask your principal about that. And there's a part of you that's a Sheni Yedei Elishal. You can ask yourself about that or your therapist about that. So within each and every one of us, there's the Chacham, there's the Russia, there's the Tam, there's Sheni Yedei Elishal. It depends on the hour, depends on the day, and depends on the week. And all of them come to the Seder, and all of them are sitting at the table. And the God says, I want to speak to all the parts of you. I don't only want to speak to the Chachim in you, I want to speak to the Rosh in you, the Tam in you, the Sheni Yedei Elishal in you. They say there was once a Jew from Chelem in Poland who decided to go to Vilna to check out the scene in Vilna, the big city in Lithuania, or Shalayim de Lita. So he goes to Vilna, he comes back from Vilna to Chelem, and he says, it's amazing what I found in Vilna. I walked into shul, I sit down in shul, and I have a conversation with a Jew. And I meet there a Jew, he's an atheist. I meet a Jew who's a believer. I meet a Jew who's an agnostic. I meet a Jew who's a communist, a socialist, a capitalist, a right-winger, a left-winger, a believer, a heretic, a Zionist, an anti-Zionist. On a Pikoiris Gomer, a Talmud Chachem, an Ama Oritz, an Erlich Yid, a Ganev, a Crook. Unbelievable. Every type of person I met there. So they ask him, What's, What are you so excited about? And Chelem, we also have all these types of people. He says, You don't understand, it was all the same Jew. It was the same person. The same person operates on many different levels. So Darba Bonem exists within each and every person. Let us begin the journey. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it would be lovely to exhaust the topic more, but we will give Be'ezer Hashem a few minutes to each child and bring out one point. Shivim Panam L'Torah, there are 70 faces to Torah, Chazal say. The Haggadah doesn't have 70 faces. The Haggadah has thousands and thousands of faces. You go into a bookstore and you'll see, I don't know if there's any other part of the year, Seder of the year that has so much commentary and so many interpretations and there are people that buy 50 Haggadahs before Pesach and they come to the Seder with 30 of them and they plan to read the Haggadahs and get inspired. The problem is that when they open the first Haggadah the first child spills out their cup of wine. Then they, get, they clean it up they want to get back to the Haggadah and somebody turns over their Kaira. Then there's a fight in the kitchen, and 20 minutes later, somebody needs stitches. And this guy is with his 30, 40 Haggadahs, and he was planning a spiring Seder in the heavens, and at this point, he doesn't know what hit him. Everybody is stressed out, the kids are tired, the guests don't know if they should sit or come or go. They're starving, they're tired, they're exhausted, and he still has 50 Haggadahs to read. He has the Svasemes, and he has Rip Tzodik. And he has the Briska Haggadah, my base slave, he has a Bishor Leib Diskin's Haggadah. He has a Baron Kotler, he has a Gadi, he has a Bissa Zalman Meltzer's Haggadah. He has a Belza Haggadah, he has a Munkacha Haggadah. Right? He has everybody's <laughs> He has everybody's Haggadah, but the wine is all over the place, the matzah is broken, the kaira is messed up, they forgot to make the charoises, the lettuce is not dry, he's afraid of Gebrocht, whatever is happening. And he's starving, and when men are starving, you know, it's never a good idea. So well, a guy once came to me, how miserable his Seder was. He had all these Agadahs. So I told him, you missed the point. All I know, it says about the Seder, is v'higadah to levincha. It doesn't say to bring 50 Agadahs. It says, connect to your child. Go out of your cocoon and speak to your child. 
Celebrate your child. Tell your child, ask all your questions on life. Hineni, I'm here. Let's talk, let's have a good time, let's be free. Let's celebrate life together. Let's bond like I bonded with my father and he with his father for 3,328 years. Don't create an idol Seder that lives in heaven. Extricate yourself from the normal world and suddenly you get frustrated when things don't work out the way you want. We got to live in, speak to your child. And in many ways, we'll see, this is what addresses the first question. Chacham ma'oimer, this is a great chacham. And the Arizal even teaches us, we're not going to go in that direction tonight, but it's just for context. The Arizal says that the Arba Bonim represent the four worlds. In Kabbalah, you have four parallel universes, Atzilus, Bria, Yitzira, Asiya. And he says the Chachem addresses the world of Atzilus, which is the highest spiritual universe of complete intimacy with Hashem. Atzilus is from the word Eitzel, Samoch, close. And then you have the Tam is Bria, and the Sheni Yedel is Yitzira, and then the Rosh is Asiya. And there the two are pointed, are put together. And it's interesting that the Chachem and the Rosh come right near each other. First you say, Kafa Be'ike, but you put him right near the Chachem, you don't even put him at the end. The Chachem Ma'awaymer, the Chachem says something profound. What does he say? The first child we address is, and I should say thank God for such children, the holy child. Not just Chachem in terms of intelligent of a high IQ, often the Rosh has has an IQ maybe sometimes higher, but the Chachem has Chachem, Koyachma. The Chachem is sensitive, he's spiritually sensitive, he's in tuned. And he asks an interesting question. It's one of the most idealistic questions in Judaism. Judaism is divided into three groups. We all know the Ramban says there's the mitzvahs called Edis and Chukim and Mishpatim. Mishpatim are rational mitzvahs. Don't steal, don't lie. When you borrow money, pay back. It's a rational mitzvah. Etc. Respect your father and mother. Edis. We all know our mitzvahs like Shabbos, Yom Tif, Tfilin, symbolic. They represent ideas through customs, through ritual. Chukim are what we call super rational mitzvahs. It's hard to understand the meaning, the objective, what's the point. Don't wear wool and linen. Don't eat cheeseburgers. What's the objective? A maizah with ashes and water, red heifer, a bunch of sacrifices. It's very hard to understand. These are called chukim. We have distinctions. The Chachem says, the Ben Chachem says, I don't understand. Why are there even distinctions here? These distinctions demonstrate the fact that we're trying to introduce human emotion into a relationship with God. This child is such a sweet, such a good, such an idealistic child. He says, for me, all the mitzvahs are identical. The Rebbeinu Shalolim asked me to do something, and I do it. What's the difference? Edis, chukim, mishpatim, I understand, I don't understand. When you have a really romantic relationship, does it matter what your wife asked you to do? What's the difference? Sometimes she asks things that make sense, and sometimes things don't make sense. A young man called me, he says that his wife wants flowers for Shabbos. I should explain to him rationally what roses do for a person. What am I supposed to tell him? So I told him, my dear friend, listen to me, you'll have a good marriage. Some things you shouldn't be thinking about. It's just like para aduma. Para aduma. A red rose reminds you of the para aduma. This is a red heifer, and this is a red rose. That's it. This God wants, this your wife wants. It's the same thing. Shiny as Shalom Bayis. He does it every week. He shechts a para aduma and he sprinkles the ashes, whatever he does. He has water. I hope he doesn't bring in ashes to the house, but hopefully he puts the roses in the water. In a real relationship, what's the difference? Edis, chukim, eshpatim. It's not about me. It's about the Rebbeinu Shalom. Judaism is not about me, what I gain, what I understand, what I comprehend, what I experience. Ask not what God can do for you. Ask what you can do for God. 
I'm not paraphrasing Kennedy. <laughs> Kennedy paraphrased the Balatanya. Yeah, there was a chassid who came to the Balatanya and he complained about his life. He needs this, he needs this, he needs this. So he told him in Yiddish, he said, Du zogst alts, was du dafst. Avos medav dir, zogst the garnished. You speak a whole time about what you need. You don't speak about what you're needed for. So the Ben Chacham says, I don't want to speak about what I need. I want to speak about what I'm needed for. Why does Judaism acknowledge this distinction? In a way, what he's saying is something that's very profound. He says, Judaism is an opportunity to abandon, to transcend the human experience, to touch heaven, to touch the divine. My condition, my limitations don't matter. What matters is I'm a servant, I'm loyal. If God would want me to chop wood in the morning instead of putting on tefillin, I'd be happy to chop wood. Ilunitztavinu, there's an expression. Ilunitztavinu lach in Lakuta Torah. Ilunitztavinu lach tevetsim. If he would have told me to chop wood, it would have been good. It sounds very beautiful. It sounds very romantic. It sounds very heavenly, and it is. But the Haggadah says, "Va'af ate emer loy kehilches apesach." You have to speak to him that even Pesach has halachas. Pesach means to leap. To jump, to jump over all the limitations. And even that has halacha, even that must have a structure. And where do you see this? We want that the taste of the matzah should linger in your mouth, that the matzah also must have a taste. Matzah represents, as the Zoya says, Michla de Mehemnusa, the bread of faith, the bread of belief. As the Pasuk says in Yirmiya, you abandoned Egypt, you went into a desert, you didn't even let your dough rise. It was the bread of faith then, the bread of faith now. And even matzah must have a taste. What does it mean it must have a taste? It should permeate your taste buds. It should permeate your experience. Famous line of the Kotzke Rebbe on the Pasuk, Mishpatim Anshe Kodesh, Tiyun li. So he said in Yiddish, Ich will is al zain, menschen von Helikait, a menschliche Helikait. There is holiness that is superhuman, and I want your holiness to be human. The reason it's so important is because people who often abandon completely the human experience, what happens is when they come back down, and it happens, they sometimes fall very, very hard because there's no integration. They're inspired. I have no identity. My personality is irrelevant. My emotions are irrelevant. I'm a servant of God. And then when I wake up one day and I feel myself often, I lose it all. What also happens often to these people is they're very judgmental of others. In their unique quest for holiness, they become intolerant to anybody that is different. And this is a stage that many chachamim go through. Many youngsters go through. They forget themselves in a genuine quest to connect to God. And God says, that's wonderful, but I need you to taste the matzah. <speaking in Hebrew> Judaism and godliness and infinity ought to permeate and penetrate the human condition. It should be integrative. It should be holistic. It should permeate you as a human being. And then... You won't fall down into the abyss one day. You'll also be able to appreciate the human challenge. Holiness ought to be human. You will not become an angel who cannot tolerate people. Don't forget that you're human and God wanted you to be human. That's why there's Adis, that's why there's Chukim, and that's why there are Mishpatim. The second child comes from a very, very different point of view. The first boy in your house, you're trying to convince him to eat dinner. You're trying to convince him to go to sleep. You know that child? You have to, you don't know that child doesn't exist anymore? You have to convince him to relate to his humanness. You have to convince him not to look at himself and other people as the epitome of evil, to be able to embrace his emotions, to be able to embrace her personality, to understand that Anshe Kodesh Tiyunli, God wants people, not angels. And your humanness is part of Avodah Hashem. It's not evil. That's the first child. The second child, 
whom we call Russia and translate wicked, but I don't think wicked is the right word. I would call it more, uh, we'll soon see what we can call it, maybe rebellious or maybe, uh, maybe in pain, in pain. He asks a very good question. He says, You call this man Cheresenu, don't you? This is a time of freedom. Whoever heard that this is what freedom looks like? For a month before, they're slaving away. They're slaving away, cleaning, scrubbing, rubbing. The night before, people are walking around with candles in holes and crevices, under beds, looking for some speck of chametz. The next morning, they wake up early with a vengeance. They destroy all of this horrible leaven. Then start the preparations. There's no holiday in the world that has so many laws, requirements, nuances, details, and chumras, Baruch Hashem, like the holiday of Pesach. Whoever came up with this definition of freedom, what are you doing? And the word is avoid. Melech is avoid. This labor. This is man cheruseinu. I want to be a free person. Leave me alone. I can relate to certain aspects of Judaism that are charming, that are cute, that are nice. But what's this whole avodah? God took you out from bondage, and what did he do? He put you in a new bondage, and worse. Because Pari at least doesn't know what you're doing in the bathroom. Pari at least doesn't control you 24 hours a day. But here we tell you how to cut your nails, how to tie your shoelaces, even forgive me how to go to the bathroom. This is called freedom? This is what you're thankful for? I don't need your bite and I don't need your honey. This is his question. You see that this child exists in every person. Well, not in every person, but in plenty of people. He's a very interesting boy. These questions come up in almost every yeshiva, every classroom. Unless they're thrown out. It's not like they don't ask the questions. They just ask the questions elsewhere or they're convinced there's no answer. But this is a very real question. Very different than the first question. But he says, I don't want to. I'm not interested in this. This is a weird, weird religion. And everybody's obsessed with the sheer hadas. You ever saw? And then Kedei Achilles Pras. You ever saw what that looks like? There's people that sit at the Seder with a clock. And they eat two chazesim of matzah. And they don't do Reb Chaim, no. They do chazoy nish. And they do both chazesim. And you have to swallow them simultaneous. And they do achilles pras four minutes. And you try doing it in four minutes. I know a guy, Mamish, almost had a heart attack. He got so obsessed and so uptight. Mamish almost died on the spot. And somebody said to me, this is man cheruseinu. Eat, relax, eat slow. This is how free people eat. You ever saw what a saber looks like? How comfortable people are during a saber? Say, why are you doing this? Why are you sitting like an oiska klapta shina by shina rabbit torturing yourself? He says, because that's how free people eat. <laughs> it's very funny. <laughs> So he says, I don't understand. What are you doing? This is what this kid has to say. He comes to the table. He just doesn't get it. And the truth is, a whole generation of Jews said this. A whole generation of Jews said this. And shows a different style. The Haggadah now responds to this child. And the response is very nuanced. Very deep and very sensitive. First thing the Haggadah says is, Lefisha Hoitzi Esatzme Menaklal, Kafa Be'iker. What we're tempted to do is scream at this boy and say, You're a Kafa Be'iker. Or in modern terminology, You're an Apikiris, You're a Kafa, You're a Min, You don't have a Chelik in Elam Haba. That's what you are. Somebody asks a question, if people don't have an answer, Kfira! You ever heard that one? It's called Kfira 101. You swipe the credit card called Kfira. Apicursus. You don't have an answer. What are you calling it Apicursus? Say I have the same question. And I never knew how to deal with it. 
So I call you an apikaitis. But for that, we have to be honest. What are you screaming apikaitis? You know what an apikaitis is? You know what a min is? You know what a kaifer is? You know the definitions? How do you know he's an apikaitis? Because he has a different opinion than what you think is truth. Did you research it? Do you know all the opinions about it? What's shreis tekvira apikursus? It's an easy word. We love the word because it makes me feel like I'm the maimon. Somebody asks you how much you believe, you know how much you believe. But the main thing, he's an apikaitis. So the Haggadah says, let me tell you something. Most people that are kaifa be'ikr, they're not kaifa be'ikr. They're hoitzi atzmim in haklam. They feel that they have no part in this community. They feel that nobody gives them space. They feel that they have no identity here. That's why they're kaifa be'ikr. They're not essentially heretics. It's seldom to find a real, real heretic, especially in today's day and age. For the first starters, you have to be educated. You really have to know a lot to be able to be a kaifa and apikairis. They say that one of the Israeli prime ministers said that she wants to have, there should be an intense Jewish education in the Israeli public schools so that the kids should know what we don't believe in. You have to really know what you don't believe in. It's very unique, it's very rare. How many real kaifa and do you have? Because Anish writes in one of his chuvas, he says that's almost impossible to have today. So what God is saying is, is even then, the worst thing you can do to somebody is expel them from the klal. Make them feel like a mitzayrah. The moment a child feels, I have no home, I have no Pete, no friend, I have no mentor, I have no love, I have no friendship, I have no place here, then they need an identity. So what's going to be their identity? So he reads the latest website, and he becomes a kaifa baker. He hears a few questions that people ask, he becomes a kaifa baker. That's number one. But then the Haggadah takes it a step further and says, don't be in moitzi minaklal, embrace this child. But af yeshinov. I know that he's biting and he's biting very hard. This kid is cynical. This kid is sharp. This kid is mocking and laughing from everything you consider holy. And those teeth are really, really aggressive and really powerful. But va'af atahake yeshinov. You have to know what to ignore. Get beyond his teeth and realize that most kids at risk are really kids in pain. And most of these sharp statements are really desperate cries for love, for validation, for empathy, for understanding. Don't become a victim to the teeth. Go beyond the teeth. Imagine that you can ignore, be confident enough that you can ignore the sharp statements because those sharp statements, those teeth are really much less scary than they appear to be. They are just a hungry soul yearning for something deep, for something real. Remove the cynicism, the sharpness of his bite. Smooth out his rough edges. Don't respond to roughness with roughness. Don't respond to teeth with another set of teeth. Don't get, don't get caught up in his snidey remarks and in his cynical comments. Inside, this boy, this girl is crying. And usually, it's the wisest and most sensitive who end up in these situations. Ask any parent or any teacher who deals with children who are so-called very, very rebellious, and you'll see the mother will say, he was the most sensitive of all of my children. He was the kindest, the sweetest, the deepest, the smartest. Those teeth are symptoms of deep pain. Remove the edge and you will discover the glow inside. And if you think here Rabbi Jacobson is giving us liberal pop psychology Torah. So I'll tell you a word from somebody you can't expect, you suspect of this. 
because he wasn't just a Litvak, he was the father of all Litvaks, the Vilna Gaon. The Vilna Gaon writes, what's Hake Shinov? Listen to this, what's Hake Shinov? So the Vilna Gaon says, Russia is the numerical value of 570. Reish is 200, Shin is 300, Ayin is 70, 570. Tzadik, Tzadik, Dalid, Yud, Kuf is the numerology of 204, right? Kuf is 100, Tzadik and Yud is 200, Dalit is 4. So you have 570 and 204. Zog de Vilna Gon, Af Ata Hake Shinov. Shinov, Shin Nun Yud Vav is 366. Shin is 300, Nun Yud is 50 and 10 is 60, Vav is 66. He says, Af Hata Hake Shinov. Take the teeth out of the Russia. Minus 366 from 570. What do you end up with? You end up with your tzaddik. That's it you have to do. Just take out the teeth. You are obsessed and you're overwhelmed by the teeth. You can't even see the pnimius. Haki Yashinov. Get beyond the tough edge. Get into the soul. You'll see your big Russia is really an innocent tzaddik. 570, you'll take off 366, you get it? And you'll end up with your tzaddik, you'll have your 204. I read years ago that there was a uh, John Hopkins uh, professor who gave a group of graduate students an assignment, a very interesting assignment. He said, I want you to go to the slums, literally the slums of the slums. And I want you to take 200 boys between the ages of 12 and 16 growing up in the slums and investigate their background and investigate their environment. Then I want you to predict their chances for success in the future. <coughs> the students consulted social statistics. They did some investigation about the particular area. They spoke to the boys. They compiled data. And their conclusion that they presented to this professor of John Hopkins, this was part of their graduate work, was 90% of the boys, of these 200 boys, 90% would spend some time in jail. It was not a question based on how the system works in those slums. 25 years later, another group of graduate students was given the job of testing the prediction of the first group. That's a quarter of a century later. They went back to the same area. Some of the boys, by now men, were still there. A few had died. Some moved away. They got in touch with 180 boys from the original 200 that were interviewed 25 years before. And they found that from a group of 180, only four of them have ever been sent to jail, and even those a short period of time. Why was it, they wondered, that these men who had lived in a breeding place of crime. How did it happen that they had such an astoundingly, surprisingly good record? So the researchers, the new group of students, were told by, by most of these boys, well, there was a teacher. They kept on hearing that mantra, there was a teacher. So they pressed further, what teacher? What? Everyone has a teacher. And they found that in 75% in of the cases, it was the same teacher, a woman teacher that they had. So they went to this teacher. She was now quite an elderly lady. It's been 25 years after she's been teaching and she was middle-aged. She was living in the home for retired teachers that they had over there. And they asked her, how did you extend such a remarkable positive influence on the group of boys? Could she give any reason any method, any mechanism, why all of these boys remember her a quarter of a century later. They were 12 years old. What did she do right? And she says, I really don't, I really don't know. I had no methodology, no mechanism. I was just a teacher. And they pressed her because they were trying to create a paper that would, uh, that would be useful for further research. And she says, I really did nothing. And then they wrote this, thinking back over the years, she said amusingly, almost speaking to herself more than to the researchers, she says, I love those boys. She was like almost whispering to herself, remembering. And the researchers understood that that was really it. 
almost to herself, Mesiach Lefitumai, so to speak, matter of fact. Oh, I love those boys. Hake Yashinov, you have to be able to love those boys. You have to be able to love those girls genuinely. But the Haggadah says something even deeper. And that is, look at his teeth. Nobody is born with teeth. Some mammals are born with teeth. These teeth that this child is portraying, they're not his natural or her natural self. The potential for teeth existed. The teeth, we're born without teeth. So we should nurse our mother's milk. This is not their natural state. Something happened. There was a distortion. Don't define the entire person by the teeth because this is not their natural, essential state. But the Haggadah is saying something even deeper. And that is, after we get through all of this, we actually tell him something very profound. And what we tell him is, you really believe that freedom means doing nothing. Why all these mitzvahs? Why all these requirements? In other words, freedom means letting nature take its own course. I want to be a couch potato, I'll be a couch potato. But then, hake is shinov. You have no business having teeth. Because when you were born, you did not have teeth. Many mammals do have teeth. But the human story is a story of development, of work. We don't embrace things the way exactly, we, the way we were born, and that's how we keep it. Then we shouldn't be walking. We should continue to be nursing our whole life. We don't do that. In fact, most animals, a few seconds or hours or days after their birth, they're already in some ways, not completely, but in some ways self-sufficient. Yismach Moshe says, Vayoymer elikim, nasa adam. What's nasa adam? In the plural. Why nasa adam? So he says, all animals, the Klayokar has an interesting, uh, similar insight, all animals a few hours after they're born, they're not babies anymore. They're running around. Vayoymer elikim. When it comes to a person, Hashem turns to Tati and Mami and He says, Nasa Adam, kum lomer machen amen tzazamen. Let's create a human being together. I need your help in molding a human being. It's a process, it's development. And we know that even at the age of 30 or 40, we're still trying to have the baby grow up. Nasa Adam b'tzalmeinu kid musaynu. Let's make a human being together. So in other words... Man, woman achieves their ultimate purpose only through work, only through discipline, only through challenging themselves. Like in the violin, as I told you once, in the violin, if the chords are not tied down, the music will never play. Say, let the chords be loose. They can be loose, but the music will never play. We tell him even further, we say, leave Eloi loi, ilu haya sham loi haya nigo. We do it in third person. There's a very profound statement here. What is the profound statement? We're telling the Ben Rasha, if he would have been there, he wouldn't have been redeemed. We don't say you, we say he. Meaning, if a child like you would have existed, would have... Before I say the answer, isn't it strange to speak to somebody like this? Imagine somebody sitting at your table and says, why are you doing what you're doing? If he would have been there, he wouldn't have been redeemed. <laughs> you will learn the Haggadah and Pshat, there's something off here. Say something. Why don't you say the benefits if he will embrace what you, what you believe in? Why the negative? Why the negative? This is the most positive statement you could say. If this fellow would have been there in Egypt, before Matan Torah, before you'd see him, he would have not been redeemed. You had to make a choice. If you didn't want to go out, you didn't go out. That's if he would have been there. Today, once you stood at Sinai, and God declared that you are part of Mamleches Koyanim Vigoy Kaddish, you're part of a kingdom of princes and a holy nation, of course you will be redeemed. You are an indispensable part of the Jewish people, you are a piece of the divine. You are essentially sacred and holy. There's nothing in the world that can sever your wholesome relationship with God, even 
If you choose not to acknowledge it or you're unaware of it, intentionally or unintentionally, the love to you is absolutely unconditional. You are wholly based on your essence, your core, and there's nothing that can compromise and tarnish and destroy that holiness. And if that's the case, the only way you will experience freedom in life is if you learn who you really are. I cannot be free by making believe I'm a horse. I can't be free by making believe I'm a cat. Sometimes it's nice to be a puppy, but I will never be free as a puppy because I'm not a puppy. I hate to break it to you. You say, Maha Let me tell you, is it true that many Jews follow a lot of rituals and they see absolutely no significance in it? Yes. But if you will have the courage to study and explore, you will see that every detail and every mitzvah is a tool for your ultimate self-realization and self-expression because it's who you are. It's not here to destroy your reality, to crush your reality. It's ultimately here to express your reality. They tell the story, Medrash brings a story, a very deep story. When Hashem created the bird, the bird said to God, he says, I don't understand you. I have such thin and weak legs. How will I outrun my predators? So Hashem said, ah, I'll protect you. And he gives the bird a beak. He says, this ugly beak, no way, out. So he gives the bird claws. The bird looks and says, I'm such a beautiful bird. Why claws? No way. So God says, I'll give you something else. And he places on the bird what we call wings. The bird feels this new burden of flesh coming down on it and says, God, master of the universe, I'm weak as it is. Now you added more flesh, more fat to my body so now I could run even slower. And he said, no, no, no. What I added was wings that if somebody is chasing you, you can lift yourself up and soar to the heavens. You can fly away. So you can have the same reality one person calls it a crazy, excruciating, painful burden. But from another perspective, it's wings. What does it depend on? If you know who you are. If you know who you are, you will learn that this is your music. A fish is submerged in water. Imagine the fish says, I want to visit the dry land. I would like to tour Manhattan and Muncie. This is ridiculous, being in water 24 hours a day. <laughs> the fish doesn't do that in the famous metaphor of Rabbi Akiva and Bracha Samachalov. Why? Because this is life. For the fish, this is life. Anything else is death. This is the deepest form of self-expression. I want to show you these words by one of the great Hasidic masters, of Tzadik HaKoyin of Lublin. Pre Tzadik Vayikra for Pesach. Extraordinary piece, literally an extraordinary piece. Take a look. Baruch Hamokim Baruch Hu Baruch Shnasan Torah Lami Yisrael. Bazem Merumas Shloishin Yonim Shonu Moedim Lakadosh Baruch Hu Aleim Kameshin Mesaim Kenegad Arba Banim Dibre Torah. We'll get back to this. For Lachayre Yesh Lahavin, I have a big question. Vahadiksi Vahayikayim Raleichem Bneichem Maavoy Dazoyis Lachem Vayikidam Vayishtachavu Pirush Nashin Al Psurus Abon. You remember we learned before. The first pasuk about the children. Moshe says, your children will tell you what's this avoida. So you'll tell them about the Pesach. And the nation kneeled and bowed down. So what does Rashi say? Why did they bow down? They heard they'll be liberated. They heard they'll come to Eretz Yisrael. And the third thing is, Psurus habonim. They're going to have children. Ask Shep Tzadik. Mazu psurus sheyivoldu bonim? Zeh yitochin liyish prati hu psurus sheyivolid bonim. Aval uma shleim aloi oilam ki min hago inoyig she noisim noshim umay lidim bonim. Givaldik a question. Moshe turns to four million Jews and he says, you're going to have children and they're going to ask you, what in the world are you doing? They're like, yeah, we're going to have kids. If you have an individual couple, Khalila infertile, and Moshe Rabbeinu says, you're going to have a child like Avram and Sarah, wow, you bow down. You're speaking to a whole nation. 
Every nation has children. Oilam kimin hagei noyig. The way, but it is a miracle, no question. But that's the biological system of the world. Animals reproduce, plants reproduce, insects reproduce by the hundreds of millions and billions. Birds reproduce, they hatch, and humans reproduce. That's the fact. So why are they dancing and celebrating? Moshe didn't point to a couple. Where did they think they came from, these four million Jews? Not from parents? Not from grandparents? Was it the grace of Surah? You know what Reb Tzaddik says? Tzaddik says, no, this is deep. Which children are we talking about here? are which children? The Rishayim. These are the Rishayim, the people who don't ask. They say, they bite, they scream, they're cynical. They're mocking you. That's who we're talking about. Not regular children. He's talking about the Russia. Why are they celebrating? Because Moshe was telling them a message. You know those kids, they will never, ever, ever ultimately be expelled or driven away from Jewish people from the Jewish people. Now they started to dance. That's Psura Sabbanim. Not that they have children. Baruch Hashem. That every single child, even that child that everybody is giving up on, that the principal calls you in and said, we try, there's nothing to do. Child that have nothing to do in your house. That child is as holy as any other child. The Chei Nisa B'Gemar, it's a Gemar in Sanhedrin Memdalet, about Achan. Achan was despicable. He stole from the spoil of Yerichai in contrast to Hashem's commandment in the presence of open miracles. Zog de Gemara, Achon, Afapi, Shechata, Yisraelhu. And today's times we sometimes have to say, Afapi, Shaloi, Chata, Yisraelhu. Even a from Jew is also Jewish. Af, Sha'over, Al Kol, He transgressed the altar, the Gemara says in Sanhedrin, Moshach, Bar, Lasa, Yisherot, Shloi, Akiru, Boisho, Mo. The man didn't want people should see that he had a bris. So he pulled his foreskin to cover his bris. In other words, it wasn't just he did a sin. You know, he ate the hashgach, it wasn't glat. He didn't eat the badats, he ate rabbanut. He didn't want to identify with the Jewish people. It's like, I'm not part of you guys. He said, in this world you're being punished. But don't think you're expelled from the next world. The Mishnah says in Sanhedrin Daf Tzadik, the beginning of the 11th chapter, Perek Chelek. There are three Jewish kings and four ordinary people who don't have a Chelek Loilam Haba. You remember who they are? Yeravam, Achav, Menashe, Doig, Gechazi, Achisoifel, and Bilam. They don't have no Chelek and Loilam Haba. They're lost forever. Comes the Gemara in Sanhedrin of Kuvdal Ramid Beis, and the Gemara says, Who made this list? And the Gemara says, The list was made by Anshe Knesses Hagdoila. These were the greatest of the Jews who built Judaism in the beginning of the second base Hamikdash. The groups of Mordechai, Chagai, Scharia, Malachi, Ezra, Shimon, Atzadik, Zerubavel, it's Ezra, Nechemia. They made this list. Comes the Gemara and says, Doshe Rishumais Amru. What's Doshe Rishumais Amru? People who expound on Rishumas, Rashi says on verses, on Psukim. Rishumas literally means Rishumas means transcripts or Rishima. Doyushi Rishumas, those who darshan the Rishimas. Who are these people? We don't know, we'll see in a moment. Amru, kulam bayim loylam haba chutz me bilam. Doyushi Rishumas, Amru, the Antik Nesasak Doyla said, no. The Doyushi Rishumas, the Gemara says, said, everyone is coming to Elam All these Jews are coming to Elam Haba. Menashe, Achav, Yeravim. Yeravim was no big tzaddik. Says Reb Tzadik, Doshe Rishum is Hainu, Shemasigim Hargosha Lamaila Misechel Enushi, Vuhuraka Moi Roishim. What's a Roishim? You have sometimes something written on a piece of paper, it's clear. What's a Roishim? A Roishim means huh? an impression, a symbol, a simon. It's not a clear message. Doshe Rishum means, he says, people who detect, they detect feelings 
that are beyond human comprehension and intelligence. They're not clearly articulated. Not everybody can see it. You have to be extremely super spiritual sensitive. That's Using human faculties, we're saying, look at these guys. They were really, really despicable. They were not people who just, you know, who just did wrong things. They made churbanas, these three chavre. Hiravam, Achav, Menashe. Pan ditten terroristen moshchosen. Virak hadoshi reshumis amru sheshlam chelik al ma'aba. Why? Machmas shei mezera Yisrael. The Yiddish and the Shamas. V'afal pi shechati Yisrael uvala Yiddish memenu nidach. Comes Reb Tzodik and says, Al absura hazu hayu smech. This is why they rejoiced for the kids. When they heard that even this Ben Rasha will have Kedusha Yisrael Oilam, ah, this was completely transformed their whole perspective. Comes Reb Tzaddik and says, go back to the Haggadah, Baruch HaMokim, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shanas and Torah Yisrael, Baruch Hu. Why is that an introduction? Those are the four children. You have to understand and relate to Hashem in a different way and communicate to each of these children a different aspect. Baruch HaMokim, you could tell to the Ben Chachim. To the Rasha, you have to know Baruch Hu. To the Tam, you could say Baruch Shanas and Torah. To the Eni Yedei again, Baruch Hu. That's why it's an introduction. And he says... Mokim represents God as the space of the universe. The Chachem recognizes Hashem everywhere. He recognizes Malchus Hashem. Baruch HaMokim. The Gemara says, He's the, the space of the world. Says Reb Tzadik, once Hashem redeemed us and turned us into a Jewish nation because he's a Jew and he had a bris he may call himself a Rosh Marusha. he says I don't belong the truth is he belongs. He's essentially connected. This is who he is. He's sacred. He's holy. He has a chelik, a lekami, mal mamash. He's a piece of Hashem. We speak to the Rasha. We say, who? Leave a loy loy ilu hoya. And we speak about Hashem. We say, baruchu. Like in third person. He, not you. Why? represents the element of Hashem that's beyond human intelligence. It's not mokoim. I could look at God and see Him in the space of the world. This is who? Transcendent. Sometimes in my seichel I say, no, no, no. I can't deal with this. You're not part of this group. He says, don't limit God. You don't understand everything. Baruch Hu. There's an element that's who. That I can't see. I can't detect. I can't comprehend. I can't understand soul's journeys. They're very, very deep. Open yourself up to a future depth. Open yourself up to a layer of the soul that you have to be ready for. You have to be exposed to it. This is Baruch Hu. This is the introduction to the Ben Rasha. Let's go to the third child very, very briefly. If we do it a little more long, we'll be sitting here till the Afikaiman. And you still have uh, to do B'dikas Chametz and Bittl Chametz and so on and so forth. So very B'kitzer. I'm not going to elaborate. I'll just say the point of the other two children. At least we'll discuss one, one point. The Tam is the third child who exists in each and every one of us. And the Tam, we call him a simpleton, a Tam, Probably the more appropriate word would be the confused child. The Chacham is spiritually lofty, he's holy. He wants to detach himself from the human experience. The Russia doesn't realize how holy he or she is. 
And that's why they call themselves a Russia. And the worst thing we can do is take them seriously. That's the worst thing we can do. Take them seriously in the sense of believing that they're evil and they're not part of the klal and turn them into kofri biikr. The Tam is a confused soul. He's confused. What is he confused by? He doesn't have the ability to be able to commit to anything. Some people, it's called sitting on the fence. They're nashers. They like shmogas boards. You ever see shmogas boards? They don't want to miss out anything. They go from one to the other to the other and everything you want to taste. There's people who live their whole life by a shmogas board. This is the confused child. He is driven by so many different forces that compete. I like this, I like that. Somebody once told me, they said, Rabbi, we spoke about, speaking about kosher, they said, we keep kosher in the house. In the house we keep kosher. When we go out, but in the house we keep kosher. Deary, deli, milk, pleasure, outside. I said, it's wonderful, wonderful news. They say, why? We thought you would be, you wouldn't like it. I said, I'll tell you, because one thing I know, that after 120 years in heaven, all your cutlery is going to go straight to paradise. <laughs> you and your wife, I'm not sure. But the cutlery, the dishes, the forks, the knife, the spoons, the plates, they're going straight to Gan because they were kosher. I said, what is this, a joke? What? <laughs> what's a joke? What's the difference? Yeah, it's a different body when you come outside. What, in the airport there's no God? In the restaurant there's no God? What, what's the difference? Your house, not in your house? But that's how we are. That's how we, and everybody in their own way. And we sit on the fence. He's not against anything. He's not rebellious. He's just Tom. We're, we're driven by so many different forces and messages and contrasts. They say in the name of the Gary Rebbe, the Beis Yisrael, one of the, I think in his name or one of the G'dayli Yisrael, and he said the four children, the four sons, very penetrating insight, were the four generations of immigrants that came to this country or other countries in the beginning of the 20th century, already at the end of the 1900s or the, the beginning of the next century. He said the first generation of immigrants that came over, he says they were all Chacham and Yidin with Peyes and Yamukas and Baird, Mostly, not most, a lot of them that came from the other side, from Eastern Europe. He says, there were no yeshivas, there were no, uh, there were no schools. They all went to public school and they all wanted to integrate. So the children rebelled. They rebelled against everything. He says, that's the second generation. They became completely integrated into American culture. They could speak in English. They can go to Harvard University. They can become doctors. They can become lawyers. They could celebrate New Year's with their friends. They could become real, real Americans and join the melting pot. So that was the second generation. The third generation, he says, they were the Tom, confused. They had religious grandparents and secular parents. So for Shabbos dinner, they would go to the Baba. They would watch the Baba light Shabbos candles. She would sing with them. There was a whole generation of American Jews who knew these Nagunim. The Zaydis still read the Yiddish newspapers. There was a culture of Judaism by the Zayd and the Baba, and the parents were secular, so they were tam, they were confused between the two. And then he said, now we have a fourth generation, Shani Yedei Elishal. They're not confused anymore, they don't have what to ask, they're not confused. They never saw their grandparents, their great-grandparents, fourth, fifth, sixth generation, and so forth. This is the tragedy of the tam. He's a good kid, but there's a lot going on. Vamarte, he says, Mazois, what do you want? Mazois, what's this? What's this? What's his question? He's not challenging anything. He's not upset. He's not a rebellious. But he's confused between so many different forces in the world. It's very hard for people to make commitments. For Marte love, what you have to tell them is, People who don't have choizek yad, people who don't have conviction, people who don't demonstrate strength, remain slaves forever. Life, you have to be able to have chayzik yad. What's chayzik yad? Take a position. Take responsibility. Make commitments. Make a commitment in life. Don't just taste. Embrace. Commit. Some people can't do it in a relationship. They can't commit. They'll date for years and years and years. They just don't know how to commit. They can't commit to anything. They're always afraid. 
to throw themselves into something. They're afraid to become too passionate, too zealous to embrace something. But then you stay in Mitzrayim. Of course, don't commit to foolish, blind stuff based on indoctrination. But when you recognize a truth, don't sit on the fence your whole life. This is a challenge that has to be addressed and it's in all, in all of us. It's very difficult for us because in many ways it's easy to sit on the fence like Elio Anavi says, we want to dance at all the weddings, we want to have the cake and we want to eat it too. But in life, to be able to really leave Egypt, I have to be able to embrace and say, this I am committed to with my heart, with my mind, with my soul, with my energy, with my wallet, with my body, with my neshama. There is the fourth child. The fourth child, you got to love. Sheini Yedea Lishli doesn't know how to ask. I want to ask you a question, if I may. And I hope that Sheini Yedea Lishli forgives me that I'm using him to ask questions when he really doesn't know how to ask. So I'll ask for him. What do you have to know to ask? <laughs> I could say, any day I understand. You don't have to know anything. That's the beauty of asking. You ever hear people ask questions? It's obvious they know nothing. Present company excluded. But people ask questions. It's like obvious they know nothing. That's the point. You don't, you don't have to know anything to ask. You just sit back like this. And you ask. I don't mean you can sit in as like to hate. I'm just illustrating. You sit back and you say, how do you know? Why? Maybe not. Etc. Right? You ask. What's any of their issue? How brilliant do you have to know to ask a question? You ever hear people's questions? Einstein said two things are infinite. The universe and stupidity. And the latter is more infinite than the former. They say that there was once, I don't know what the word is. He was like a rebel. He was... I don't know, he had his, his kehill, his chassidim, whatever. And he never said Torah by the tish. He used to have a tish Friday night. They would sing and he would give food. He never said Torah ever. After a year or two, he turns to his gabe and he says, what, does the, what do the people think about me? He says, I'll be honest with you. That uh, people are saying that you may be a real amaretz. You may be a real, real ignorant man. You know nothing. He says, why do they say that? See, the guy doesn't open his mouth. Epis Epis nothing. He's like mute. He says, Echer, Echer. Six months later, he turns to the guy, he says, Nu, what's the crowd saying about me? He says, Rebbe, I'll be honest with you. There's a lot more people who are starting to suspect that you're Mamash and Amaritz. And I think, if I may interfere, if I were you, at the next tish, I would say some Torah. He says, tell me, how many people think I'm an Amar? It's honest. He says, I think it's 50% of the Hasidim. He says, but it's only 50 or it's more? He says, it's only 50. He says, the other half think I'm a Talmud Chachem? He says, yeah, and that's why I think the Rebbe should really speak. He says, if that's the case, I'm not going to say anything this week. He says, because if I open my mouth, then the other 50% will also be convinced that I don't know anything. At least 50% have a Chashad, maybe I know something. What do you have to know to ask? To answer? What, what, what do you have to know? What does the Russian know? Just say, How sophisticated. What are you doing? doesn't mean you don't know how to ask. You know what to ask. Like every word in the Haggadah is very profound. It comes from the word in Beresh. It's Adam Yada as Chava. Adam knew Chava and as a result she gave birth. She got pregnant. Now, from knowing somebody, they don't have babies. Yada is a euphemism for intimacy. Va'adam yada is chava means Adam connected to chava. He became one with chava. Va'hoyu lebasarechad, and therefore she has a baby. She gives birth to Kayan and Hevel, etc. She'eni yedei elishal doesn't mean he doesn't know to ask. He doesn't care to ask. He's not connected to anything to ask. To ask a question, I have to care. I don't care. I'm not connected. Tanya says, Das is Miloshin is Kashrus, Vihis Chabrus. Shemekasher, Atzmoy, Bekesher, Amitz, Vaadam Yoda. That's what Das is. Das doesn't mean knowledge. That's Chachme Binna. Das means intellectual intimacy. I connect with something intellectually. Ain't Yedea Lishal. 
I'm not connected to anything to ask. Nothing bothers me. You want to eat matzah? Eat matzah. You want to eat nine kazesim? Eat nine kazesim. You want to knock yourself out? Knock yourself out. You want to have 20% alcohol in your wine? Gesund to hate. I don't care. I'm not rebellious. I'm not, I'm not even confused. I'm not confused. I don't care. Anybody knows that person? <laughs> That's it. I, I'm fine. I don't hate you. I'm not angry at God. I'm not angry at religion. I'm not angry at my mother. Nobody abused me. The right way say, oh, you must have been abused. Nobody abused me. I just don't care. <laughs> It's all b'shove. I'm not connected. I don't even have a negative emotion. If somebody has a negative emotion, there's an attraction. There's an attraction. Maybe a negative attraction. It's not geschmack. But it's somehow, there's a connection there. And sometimes people have, uh, they live uh, vicariously in a relationship through a negative energy, which is an, a, a dysfunctional issue on, of, to itself. It's not for now. But uh, they glean chayas from the negative energy. It's a separate condition. This kid, or this teenager, I should say this adult, any adelisha. And sometimes the older you get, the more you become a she'eni adelisha. Been there, done that. How many times do you do b'dikas chametz? How many times you do bitl chametz? Here we go. Kol chamira v'chamia. Ten pieces. Shine. Shabbos, Yom Tif, Sukkot, Pesach, Shavuos. So all the same thing. It's all the same thing. Haman said, "Elikechem Yoshan, who God is old." Yoshan, Yoshan, Yoshan. <laughs> Sometimes the whole Judaism is one big Yoshan. There's nothing else but Yoshan. If there would be a bissel chadash, what nachiv and good. I don't mean that chadash. I mean chadash, freshness, newness. So this guy is a very interesting, he's a very interesting guy. He's a real Jew. He's not an atheist. An atheist is disturbed by God. There's no God. He doesn't have an issue. Yeah, God. No, God. I don't care. He's not busy denying anything. He doesn't care. God exists. Fine. He wants me to eat matzah. Fine. I really couldn't care less. Somebody else will offer me chametz, fine. Kidney is fine. Sushi with quinoa, good. Sushi with rice, oh, good. Svardi, fine. Ashkenazi, fine. And in many ways, this is the child we want to let go of. And this is the part of ourselves we let go of. What you do is you just go to sleep. <laughs> you go to sleep. You finish it, you go to sleep. I was once in a shul Friday night. So a guy says... In this shul, we have a policy. We knock it off. <laughs> That's our policy. That's in our constitution. We believe in knocking it off. Okay. You knock it off and you take a nap. And some people just get used to this. You know what? There's benefits, I guess. There's benefits. Mark, they say in the name of Mark Twain, he lived in Brooklyn in New York, and he said that before he dies, he wants to move to Manchester. Because he said, from there, the transition to death won't be that noticeable. <laughs> now, I personally like Manchester. I've been to Manchester many times. It's a wonderful place, wonderful. just always rains. But besides the fact London and Manchester always rain, you can't get normal weather there. But New York is not too much better. So, uh, so uh, I don't know what he meant. with, But the point is, some people choose to live as though they died. You know why? There are a lot of advantages to that. Nobody bothers you. You don't bother anybody else. It's a machaya. Nothing gets on your nerves. It's called a dead man walking. He happens to be alive biologically, but that doesn't mean much. So their Judaism is also that way. But the truth is <laughs> that this is a sad reality. It's called living a life of quiet desperation. The Haggadah says something very deep. V'she'eni yedei elishel at psachloi. At psachloi. You have to open the door. You have to open the window. What does it mean you have to open the window? The first thing is, there's no such a thing, a person who really, really doesn't care. There's people who decide at some point they don't care because nobody ever turned on the switch. 
Nobody ever gave them something to be passionate about. Nobody ever showed them truth, meaning, majesty, goodness. Every person in the world wants love. I don't know one person who doesn't. Every person in the world wants meaning. Every person in the world wants wholesomeness. Every person in the world wants a relationship. Every person in the world wants some level of MS. But after years and years of corruption or dishonesty or monotony or retune, just how many times are you going to get hurt? So you just detach. You cut yourself off. You say, you know what? It's easier to make believe I died and stop feeling emotions. At psachloi! Don't give up on this child and don't give up on this child in you. But you know how you have to do it? One condition. Shenemar, v'higadato levincha ba'yoyma hulemer ba'avurza osa Hashem, li b'tzei simi mitzray. What did you just tell me that has a message for the Eni Yedei What you just told me was, if you want to open up the window to his soul or her soul, you have to be able to speak about Bavurza Asa Hashem Li. If I'm just going to give the prepared speech, the prepared sermon, the Dvar Torah, in this week's Parsha, there's an interesting Arachayim. It ain't going to work. Bavurza Asa Hashem Li. Giso is Dain Shomad. Did anything really ever touch you? You have to get to the Li, to the me, to the core. If I strip my garments and I go to my etzim and I give somebody my core, I'll be able to get through their garments and get to their core. But there's one condition. The condition is I have to give them honesty. I have to give them rawness. I have to give them authenticity. I have to give them real Judaism, not fakoifte, recycle toyedalach. Lee, go be deeper than your garments. Go beyond your comfort zone and you'll be able to penetrate into their deepest self beyond their garments. That's why it says, Echad Chacham, Echad Rasha, Echad Tam, Echad Sheni Yedei Elishel. Before you get to the four children, the Haggadah is going to tell you, let me tell you something. You're going to hear some interesting stuff now. But I want you to know one thing. In each one of them, there's Echad. And if you're not going to be able to recognize the echa, the oneness in each one of them, then you don't hear the Dibra Torah. We're going to help you recognize the echa in each of them. It's not just four kids. It's echad chachim. In each one there's an echad. In each one there's a glow of Hashem echad, of the oneness of the Rebbeinu Shalom, consciously or subconsciously, more revealed or more concealed. And sometimes it has to be at psachle. You have to open it. And at is feminine. You have to be able to be feminine meaning. You have to be able to be full of empathy, which is a feminine quality, full of compassion, full of understanding, full of sensitivity, and to be able to be really vulnerable with them, which is usually a greater feminine skill than a masculine skill, with all, respect to, with all due respect to the Ezra's Anash. At Psachle. Then you can get to your Li, you, you can get to his Li. So the Reb Tzaddik finishes off. That's the Baruch Hu again. So remember, Baruch HaMokim is the Chacham. Baruch Hu is the Rasha. Beyond Seichel Anushi. Baruch Shinos Antar Lama Yisrael, he says, is the Tam to whom you have to be able to give him the Torah that Hashem gave and the Torah could turn him on. Bechoyzik Yod. He has to appreciate the fact that there is real conviction in the world and he has to be able to embrace it to be free. He has to be able to embrace the Torah that he gave the Jewish people because it's true. It's Torah Semes. Comes to Sheni Yedei Elishal, what now? He says, you got to go back to Baruch Hu. Fascinating. The Rosh and the Sheni Yedei Elishal, you have to connect to Baruch Hu. The Chachem Baruch HaMakim, the Tam Baruch Shanos and Torah. That's what he says in the last lines here. One, two, three, five lines from the bottom. Al Inyan Sheni Yedei Elishal, Meiram is Gamkin Tevas Baruch Hu. Shalazeh Gamkin, Ein Hasoga Seichel Anushi Lahasik. At first glance, you say, there's nothing here. This guy is numb. This guy is paralyzed. This guy is frozen. This guy is lifeless. He doesn't care. He's not connected. 
ורק מצד השם יזבורך שהוא למעלה מהסוג השכל אנושי. הבטיחונו שגם בנפוש עשיהם גם כן מכלל ישראל יחושבו ונוכל גם בנפשם להכניס קדושה ועד פסחליק יש בה גם קדושת ישראל. The problem again is here. You are relating only to God the way you see it from your limited point of view. This Baruch Hu. Elokuz, godliness is infinite and it's infinitely mysterious and it transcends human comprehension. And if you will understand that, you will be able to see that in that soul there is abundant, infinite, nuclear holiness. At Psachla, you can open it up. But for this, you have to be able to say Baruch Hamakim, Baruch Hu. Without that introduction, you can't get to your Bob on him. Now, according to all of this, we can have a beautiful homiletical understanding of the structure of the beginning of the Haggadah. Right after we start answering the questions, the four questions, we tell the story. After Avadim Hayinu, we tell the story. The greatest Tanoim of the generation. Rabbi Lezer, Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Lezer, Rabbi Azai, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Tarfun. The generation post, the century post the destruction of the second Beis HaMikdush. Are sitting in Bnei Brak. It's the night of Pesach. And they're telling the story of the exodus of Egypt throughout the whole night. Until... Their students come to them and they say, Rabbeim, our Rebbes, our teachers, the time of Kriya Shema Shal Shachris has arrived. What happened here? A lot of different interpretations. I want to present to you one homiletical interpretation, al derech haremez, al derech hanister, based on the above. There are four sons, and in each son there's an echod. There's a Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem Echod in each son. In each child, boy or girl, in the Chachem, in the Rosh, in the Tamash, in the Elishu. Shachris is Rosh Tevis. The acronym of the word Shachris is what? Shachris. So you have the Ches is Chachem. The Reish is Rosh. The Saf at the end is Tam. And then you have Shin Yud, She'enoi Yoideya Lisha. So Shachris is Rosh Tevis. She'enoi Ches Chachem. Reish, Rasha, Yud, Yodeya, and Tov, Tam. The greatest sages of the generation were sitting a whole night. They were sitting in a state of Lila, in a state of darkness, telling and teaching the story of Yitzhiya Mitzrayim to all of their children, to all of their students, to all of their disciples, which included a very wide extreme of Jews, until their students came to them and said, Rabbi Seinu, he giyaz man kriyash mashal shachris. You managed to reach the Shachris, the Chachem, the Rosh, the Tam Sheni, the Elishal, and have them all say together, Kriya Shema, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Alekeinu, Hashem Echad. You managed to discover and help each one of the children discover the Echad, the harmony, the oneness, the holistic, organic unity that exists within them in their relationship with themselves, with their soul, and with God. You managed to affect all of the children to the point that all of them, all the Shachrasen, managed to reach the time of Kriyashma, the time of Echad. And thus, right afterwards, two paragraphs later, we say, Baruch HaMokim, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shonosan, Torah Lam Yisrael, Baruch Hu, Kenegad Arba, Bonim Dibri Torah, Echad Chochem, Ve'echad Rosha, Ve'echad Tam, Ve'echad Shnei Dei Elishal. We have to affect and reach the, through the Seder. You want to reach the Kriya. How do you know the Seder was successful and effective? If as a result of the Seder, you manage to reach, higia, you touch, and you reach Zman Kriya Shema Shal Shachris, that all of the Shachris and all of the four children are engaged in Kriya Shema. You reveal the Echad in each of them. Now you know that your Seder was effective. The students have to say this to the Rebbes. The Rebbes can't say it themselves. The students said, you affected us, you transformed us to the point that you accomplished the whole story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. And that's why we have that introduction. Baruch HaMokim, Baruch Hu, Baruch HaMokim, Yisrael, Baruch Hu. By the way, it's interesting to know that there are opinions that the reason Baruch Hu is redundant is because it used to be that there was a person reading the Haggadah and he was like the narrator. And people were responding after him. It was called the Makra. The Makra, like the Makra Sahalel, the Pairis Al Shema. So therefore, the person reading the Haggadah would declare loud, he would say, Baruch HaMokim. 
And everybody in unison responded, Baruch Hu. And then he said, Baruch Shnaz and Torah Lama Yisrael. And everybody said, Baruch Hu. That would be one explanation in the repetition. But here we have even a deeper explanation, which also answers why it comes into this paragraph. Because these four Baruchs respond as we explain to the four children. And it, in Sifrei Hasidus it says that the word Baruch in Mishnah, Baruch means blessed. Baruch also comes from the word grafting. Hamavrich es hagef in the Mishnah says, if you graft a vineyard, brecha in modern Hebrew is a pool of water. When you draw basically from a wellspring or from a lake, from a stream, from an ocean, from a beach, you draw into a pool of water. Hamavrich es hagefen. Baruch means to draw forth, to draw down. For each of the four children, you have to draw down their own deeper energy to reveal the echad. For the chachem, you can bring it from Baruch HaMakim. Baruch HaMakim, that which fills the world, the space of the world, the Rebbeinu Shalom's presence in the world. He relates to Kvoid Malchus Shemayim in the world. And not only that, what, that's what you want to accomplish with the Chachem. The Chachem is very holy. The Chachem is your holy child who says, why are there Edus and Chukim HaMishpatim? Why are you making distinctions between mitzvahs? When you realize that the objective of Yiddishkeit is Dveikus, is intimacy, is connection with Hashem, who cares how? The method doesn't matter. It's all ultimately the same relationship with God. And what you're telling this Chachem is that you want the relationship should permeate and penetrate the human condition, the human faculties, the makayim, the space of the world. When you come to the Russia, you're drawing down from Baruch Hu. You have to reveal the Hu. You have to reveal the Hu, the concealed Jew in the Russia. The Afal Pishachati Yisrael Hu, the Reb Tzadik says, from the Hu of Hashem. And from the time you reveal the Baruch Shinos and Torah, La Amma Yisrael, the value of Torah, the commitment of Torah, and the Sheni Yedel Lishal again, you have to draw the Hu. And you can't compare the Tam to the Sheni Yedel Lishal. They are two very different, different creatures. The Tam is not careless, the Tam is just fearful. He's spineless, he's uncertain, he's confused. He cares. He just, it's hard for him to make a commitment. You have to teach him the power of conviction, the power of commitment. The Sheni Yedei Elishal is driven by apathy, not by fear, not by confusion, not by contrasts and different priorities, simply by apathy. Here you need the Apsachle. Which all of this explains something very fascinating. The Arizal says in Pri Chayim that the four cups of wine correspond to the four children. The first cup is the Chachem, the second Kais is the Rasha, the third the Tam, the fourth the Shani Now, listen to this. The first cup, what do we do when the first cup we make Kiddush? What do we do the third cup? We bench. The fourth cup, Halal, the end of the Seder. What about the second cup? You fill up the second cup before Magid, before the Manishtana. And the whole Haggadah is said on the Kois Sheni, on the second cup. The whole mitzvah sipur yitzias mitzrayim v'yigadah to levincha. Magid? Till rachza. Till you wash your hands and you start eating the matzah and the mora and the koyrach and the shulchan oyrach and the afikoyman. The whole Haggadah, the meat and potato of the mitzvah of the night of Pesach to tell the story of yitzias mitzrayim is said on Kois Sheni, on the second cup. And the Rizal tells us, who is that? That's Kenege de Rasha. Strange. So the whole Haggadah is said on the second cup of wine, which was instituted by the Chazal to be said on the Sipu Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. How do we understand this? Now it's all clear. It's the same reason that the author of the Haggadah put in such a harsh response to the Russia. The Russia comes to the Seder. He speaks to you. He says, Ma avoid why don't you give him a response? All the Haggadah says is, seems like, knock out his teeth, punch him in the nose, punch him in the teeth, and just tell him you would have not been redeemed. He's there by the Seder. He asked the question. Engage him, be a Makarif, tell him something. No. But now we understand. Not only are you giving him a message, this is the ultimate message of Sipu Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. You're turning to this child and you're saying, Ilu Hayasham Loi Hayanigal. If you would have been there in, Yitzhi, in Mitzrayim before Matan Torah, if you would have been in Egypt and you would say, I'm not interested, then it would have been your choice. You would have not been redeemed. But once you stood at Mount Sinai and Hashem said to every single Jew and every single Jewish soul forever, Anoichi Hashem 
I am yours. And as the Taich is brought in Kabbalah and Chesidus Anoichi Hashem Elokecha means Hashem is Elokecha. It's your God. Elokeil means strength. Chius Koyach. Anoichi Hashem Elokecha. Your Elokecha. Your true consciousness. Your true depth. Your true energy is Hashem. You're divine. Chelik Elokecha Mimal Mamish. Of course, you're going to be redeemed. Of course, you're indispensable to the story of the Jewish people. And that's why we say it in third person. Because you, of course you're redeemed. Ilu hoyasham. If somebody else similar to you, that model would have been there. Then lo hoyanigal. And indeed, the whole story of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim, we say on the second cup, to elevate this child. Because in the story of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim, you've got to elevate all of the children. Shachris, the Chachem, and the Rasha, and the Tam, and the She'eni Yedei Elishal. The Shalah says, interestingly, that the four cups correspond to the four mothers, Sarah, Rivke, Rachel, and Leah. The Shalos says this in his famous section known as Mesech de Psochim. In Shnei Luchas Habris, Rabbeinu Yeshaya Horowitz says the first cup, Kiddush, is Sarah. Sarah was the one who was Mekadesh. She began bringing Kedusha into the world, the first Jewish woman. The second cup is Rivke because the second cup is Maschil Bignus or Messiah Beshvach. You tell the story, We were entrenched in idolatry and then we came close to Hashem. And that's the story of Rivke who was taken out from the house of Lovin and Psul and brought to Yitzchak. Then you have the third cup, which is set for Rachel. The third cup is Birchas Hamaz and Benching, and it says that the Parnosa in the house always comes in the schus of the Akeris Habayis, the mother of the home, which is Rachel. And then you have the fourth cup, Hallelujah, who never stopped thanking Hashem, Hapam Oides, Hashem, the fourth cup. What do we see again? That the second cup of the Haggadah is said, with on Rivka, Rivka was that child taken out, plucked out from the thorns, Kishoshana Ben Achuchim. The Medrash applies to her the verse, like a rose among thorns. She was plucked out. Why would we begin the story of the Haggadah about the denigrated status of the Jewish people? That's what the Mishnah says. You begin with the Shanda, you begin with the negative, because the objective of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim is to elevate every child, to transform every child, even when you look at yourself or you look at your loved one. And it looks like you have to remember that the power of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim is to reach the Echad and to reveal the Echad, to reveal the oneness in each of our children. You ask an interesting question, very practical question. Right, yeah, exactly. Well, this wonderful Jew is telling us that uh, this is a distortion of the meaning of the Haggadah. He was educated that it means literally some of the children are wicked and they have to be expelled and thrown out and said, yes, they would have never been redeemed. That's the way of dealing with them. Very harshly. You know, this conversation is not abstract. <laughs> you know, when things are in the abstract, we speak about a perfect ideal world, it's sometimes easier to argue. Let's speak very realistically, okay? I have a question to you. There are many, many homes today in the most observant, Torah observant communities around the world, in America, in Israel, and everywhere else around the world. Hundreds and thousands of homes that a child or some children have drifted away from the path of Torah and mitzvahs. I make a public seder every year for many years. Okay. I ask you now a question. If I meet one of these children, that boy or girl may be your child, may be your nephew, may be your niece, may be your sibling. And yes, he was thrown out of his community or he left his community for whatever reason. Now I have a question for myself. Should I invite him to my public seder and make him feel comfortable, embrace him, and tell him that you have a place of dignity at my seder? There's a place for you at my seder. You are part of my family, you're part of our people, you will always remain a part of our family or part of our people. Or I should tell him, since you're a Russia, Give me your teeth, let me knock them out and get out of here because you would have never been redeemed. You're not part of Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim. 
I ask you this real question. If it was your child, if it was your child, and I would call you up before Pesach, and I would say, tell me honestly, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to bring in this child, or do you want me to expel this child? Like this child was once expelled, maybe from his yeshiva, wherever he was expelled. What would you tell me to do? And now I ask you, if it's not your child, if it's another Jewish child, it's not God's child? Think about this in practical terms. I'm going to finish off with two stories, two opposite stories, and you'll see the two extremes, and I think it will sum it up well. I don't know how many of you heard of the name of a Jew named Zero Mustel. Okay. <laughs> An interesting name, right? Zero Mustel. He died in 1977. Tavshin Lamed He was born in 1915. He was one of the most famous American actors and comedians. Uh, he was known for his portrayal of comic characters, Tuvia, Fiddler and the Fiddler on the Roof, etc. His name was not Zero. Zero Mustel, his mother and father at his bris did not name him Zero, which in Hebrew means Ephes, or in Yiddish, Nol. His name was Shmuel Yoyel Mustel. Shmuel Yoyel, if you want to be more precise. He was born in good old Brooklyn. He was one of eight children, Kanai and Hara, of a very observant and from Jewish family. They were raised in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, like many nice Jewish families. Ultimately, he left Yiddishkeit, he left Jewish observance. He earned world fame as a world-class comedian and actor. And he was a three-time Tony Award winner, which made him really world-renowned. When he went into the entertainment field, he changed his name from Shmuel Yoel, and his first name became Zero. And that's how he became famous, Zero Mustel. They asked him, who and how in the world did you come up with this name, Zero? You know what he said? I'll tell you what he said. He said that uh, his father would always tell him, Du bist a garnished. Und du wirst allemal bleiben a garnished. You are a zero, and you will always remain a zero. So imagine he goes off and he becomes the world famous zero, Mustel. I think there's a painfully clear message here. If you don't make your child feel special, they will find someone who does. They will find someone who will make them feel special. One story. Story number two. The Blodge of a Rebbe, Rabbi Yisrael Spiro, who passed away in 1989, Tavshin Memches, I think. How old was he? Like 100, no? 99. 99 years old. As you know, he suffered terribly during the Holocaust. His wife and children, the first marriage, was slaughtered. And at one point, he ended up in Bergen-Belsen. He was called the Wunderabiner, one of these... Uh, unique Rebbes, and the Germans had a special, unique hatred reserved for these types of Jews who were spiritual giants and admired by so many other Jews. They would torture them with a unique, sadistic, barbaric hatred if there could be something even more than their barbaric treatment of other Jews, regular, ordinary Jews. And the blush of a Rebbe was no, uh, was no different. One year, a few weeks before Pesach, he decided to do something very risky in Bergen-Belsen. There was a German commandant there who took a unique interest in him. He found him to be peculiar and strange, and he would sometimes clandestinely have conversations with him. And he felt that there was some touch of humanness in him. So a few weeks before Pesach, he says, it would be wonderful if we could bake matzah here and have matzah, and he explains to him the tradition. The man looked at him, gave a long stare at him. At some point, the Blush of Rebbe related, he said he thought he overstepped his boundaries and he could literally be shot for the request. But the man said, let me think about it. And he walked away. A week before Pesach, this guy, this Nazi commandant, brought in a little oven and he gave them flour and he allowed them to bake. They started to bake matzah 
And uh, it was like a little brick oven. And then they saw that a German was coming, so they stopped. And then somebody said, you don't have to stop. It's the commandant. It's that guy. You could do it. He gave it to us. He comes in. They were just starting to bake. And he smashes the oven. He starts hollering and screaming. Somebody basically sneaked out a letter from Bergen-Belsen, and therefore his rank was lowered. He was blamed. This is how they pay him back. And basically, they were just starting to bake. It was the end of the oven, and they had a few matzahs that they just baked that were left over. And the question was, who's going to get to eat the matzah on Pesach? So they went to the Blazheva Rebbe, and they asked him to decide who should get the matzah for Pesach. First of all, everybody was starving. But besides the fact, who's going to get to do the mitzvah? So the Blazheva Rebbe said that matzah is an obligation on every Jewish adult. So we'll take a few of the adults, and as much as we can, we'll give each a kazayas matzah. At least they should fulfill the obligation of eating matzah. This is what the Blazheva Rebbe said. He said, this is how we should do it. This was in, the, in one of the barracks. At that point, there's a voice that's heard in the barrack, a woman's voice. And she responds to the Blush of Rebbe's suggestion and she says, Binareinu ubiskeneinu. Binareinu ubiskeneinu. Meaning, of course, that when Moshe tells Pari, we want to leave Egypt, Pari says, take the adults. Moshe says, She tells the blood of her Rebbe, Moshe said, first, He said, first, the children, first, the youngsters. She had a broken body, an emaciated body. She, emaciated body. she told the blood of her Rebbe, she says, No, the matzah you have to give to Binarenu first. You have to give to the children. She says, I don't know if we're going to get out of here, but hopefully, some of the children are going to get out of here. And they still have a chance to rebuild a family and rebuild a future. If we don't give them matzah, there won't be a future to the Jewish people. We have to give the children matzah. We have to invest in the children. The blush of a Rebbe went over to her and he said, You're absolutely right. And that year amidst the horrors of Bergen-Belsen, he gave the matzah to the children who were there in Bergen-Belsen by the Seder that was led by the Blush of Rebbe. After liberation, the Blush of Rebbe married this woman. Her name was Bronya, and they began a new life. She became known as the Blush of Rebetzin. I think in her two words, Benarenu Biskenenu, she captured the soul of Pesach. Our children are our greatest gifts and our greatest future. And if we put our soul and love into it, we can open their hearts. Have a wonderful night. And a kosher and a freilich in to you and your families. Thank you. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.